Good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you for being here. Um, this is a panel, as you see, on the Cloud Act and e-evidence, and what you can call the globalization of criminal evidence. Um, my name is Peter Swire. I'm a professor in the United States at Georgia Tech. I'm also um, the research director of a group called the Cross-Border Data Forum, which studies these issues. And it's great to be a CPDP. This is the fourth year Georgia Tech has sponsored a panel here. And back four, three sessions ago, we already had a panel, Georgia Tech did, on mutual legal assistance. These issues have been percolating for some time, but with the Cloud Act and with e-evidence, now they're top of mind. And because we've had other panels on Cloud Act and e-evidence here at CPDP, this panel will try to focus especially on the issues of controversy that we've revealed in the previous panels. Um, so I'm going to give a very short introduction to why the issue matters. And we have here a representative from the US government, from the European Commission, from the CNIL, who has a role with the uh, Data Protection Board on these issues, uh, a, a, a service provider, and a, prof a professor who's expert. So we have the major institutional players, many of them here on our panel. So here's the motivation, or five years ago, why we began to research the topic. Imagine, if you will, there's a crime in Brussels, such as a murder. In the old days, the evidence was in Brussels. All of the witnesses, all of the documents were in Brussels. Today, in a world of cloud computing, many times the evidence might be in California, in a US service provider, or in some other country. Um, and that means what was a local police matter becomes an international object of attention. This happens also very much within Europe. So the European Commission, in its report last year, said that more than half of the time for criminal investigations, there is e-evidence in another country. So always before, there was a mechanism for transfers of, e of evidence. But now, in half the cases, in a huge number of cases, this um, possibility exists. And so there's the question of what will our system be for the large volume of cases compared to what used to be a small number of cases. Um, in, the, in the debates with Europe and the United States, um, one fundamental fact has been that the US in this area has strict privacy laws. So in the US, if there's evidence for content that's held by a service provider, the, in order for the government to get the information, there must be probable cause of a crime and a close link of why this evidence will prove the crime, there has to be an independent judge. The request has to be specific to this particular investigation. So there's a series of protections, including the independent judge, before the US Department of Justice gets anything, before the prosecutor gets anything. And the key thing is that under US law, it is a crime, it is a civil penalty if Google or another company gives that evidence of content to a different prosecutor, such as a Belgian prosecutor. And so when the European law enforcement comes and says we need the data, the answer is we can't give you the data because that's a crime. And then European law enforcement looks for some way to change the system because this is a frustration. So um, we're gonna uh, go through the panel. I'll introduce each person very briefly as we do it. Um, but to begin with a, an explanation of some key things under the Cloud Act, we have Ken Harris from the uh, U.S. Mission to the European Union and a representative from the U.S. Department of Justice with much experience in the area. So, Ken, briefly, very glad to have you here. Okay. Thank you, thank you Peter. Uh, and thank you also for uh, explaining the legal standards for issuing a, uh, a compulsory order to obtain content data from a US provider, uh, because that saves me from having to do it. Uh, that's one thing that is, it's a common misconception that people have, is that uh, there are, th that the Cloud Act created some kind of broad surveillance power or broad coercive power, but as you just explained, it's actually extremely targeted and, and very difficult to, uh, to get a uh, compulsory order for uh, evidence in the US, and that's one of the safeguards that we have. Uh, I'm, for those of you who were at the last panel down in La Cave, I apologize because I'm gonna make a few of the points that I made in my introduction there, uh, but I'll do them more quickly than I did there. Uh, some of the other things that a lot of people believe are that the, um, 
the Cloud Act was driven by uh, the need for the U.S. to, or the desire for the U.S. to be able to get data that is stored outside the U.S. That's not accurate. Uh, the, the Cloud Act was an effort to help our uh, law enforcement allies to be able to get evidence that's held by providers in the U.S. Uh, we're, we wanted to, we understood the problems that our foreign colleagues had in effectively investigating crime and uh, by virtue of the fact that so much uh, evidence uh, is either held by U.S. providers or uh, is rooted through U.S. providers and we wanted to make that available to them so that they would be able to effectively combat crime. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the part that gathers the most controversy is actually uh, of, of being able to obtain information from a U.S. provider, even if the provider, if they have custody and control of it, uh, has chosen to store it in a data center outside the U.S., is uh, a requirement of international law under the Budapest Cyber Crime Convention. Uh, that all of the 62 or 63 parties, it's always increasing, have to do under that convention. And so uh, this was not a new power, and it's not a unique power. It's a really rather traditional power. Uh, and then finally, um, there's uh, the concern expressed uh, frequently that the exercise of... Um, or the, uh, should I say, if, the, if a U.S. prosecutor or U.S. court issues a compulsory order for content data held by a U.S. provider, and that provider stores that content, for example, in Ireland, in a data center there, that that conflicts with uh, data protection law. Uh, as I said before, uh, the European Commission, speaking on behalf of the EU, in the Microsoft Ireland case, in my opinion, uh, said quite clearly that Article 48 is not a of the GDPR is not a categorical block to uh, obtaining a transfer, uh, and that transfer being compatible with GDPR. And uh, secondly, uh, the U.S already has a data protection agreement with the EU. It's on law enforcement transfers. And the same safeguards that we use in that context are available when we treat information that we obtain from private parties or companies in the same way as when we receive it from uh, our EU law enforcement partners. So I don't see that there should be major obstacles in uh, meeting the requirements of data protection law. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for that, that brief introduction. And we're going to try to, as we go along, we'll have the opening statements. We'll try to focus on the topics of greatest controversy that I've seen this week. Um, next, we have uh, Katrin Bauer-Bulst. Uh, Katrin, thank you for coming. She's in uh, DG Home for the commission and co-chaired the commission's e-evidence task force. So we're delighted to have you here. Yes, thank you, Peter. And thank you very much for having me. Um, I know my colleagues have already been here. It seems that you could spend most of CPDP in panels on e-evidence. So I'm very glad there's so much interest in this subject. But of course, I don't want to bore you with uh, the same introduction they've given you. So I just want to focus on a couple of statistics. Um, one comes from Google. So apparently, we consult this around 80 times a day nowadays. Every time you open an app on this, unless it's your local transport app or anything that's really localized, your data travels across borders. And you may have a service provider in one location, your data in yet another location, the app itself being updated and serviced by a third location, and you're in the fourth location. That's wonderful for us because it means that we can use the best products available regardless of where they come from. It's less wonderful for law enforcement when criminals use the same apps for malicious purposes because that means they all of a sudden have maybe three countries to deal with. And that's um, the main motivation behind our proposals, was a way to preserve that open character of the business models that help us benefit from the internet the way we do, while at the same time allowing for prosecution of crimes where that is necessary. Um, so what we see indeed, uh, and Peter has already said this, is that in more than half the cases, 
we now have a need to uh, get access to cross-border cross access to evidence to be able to um, pursue an investigation. Uh, another interesting statistic is that according to the figures from one of the service providers that receives the most requests, in 94% of these cases, the target of the investigation is actually in the same jurisdiction as the investigating authority. So that means that the target, the user whose data is being requested, is actually subject to the same rules that apply in the jurisdiction that is running the investigation. Um, and the mere fact that the service provider is elsewhere or the data is elsewhere occasions the cross-border request. Now, when you're faced with this, the question is what value the traditional MLA mechanism, mutual legal assistance mechanism, can add in that context. Because in fact, what you're looking at is a situation where that third country where the service provider may be located has absolutely no information on the data subject. Because uh, frequently could be that there's a German authority investigating, making a request to the US on a subject, data subject that is located in Germany. And then the US has very little to add in terms of uh, either the investigation or the protection mechanisms for the data subject because the US has absolutely no visibility on whether that data subject may be an MEP or may, have, may benefit from some professional protection mechanisms or such like. So that's what made us change approach. We basically um, proposed the instruments that you're by now probably familiar with, namely an order that allows the judiciary from an EU member state to directly request information from another EU member state. Um, we took a market-based approach, meaning that all service providers offering services in the union have to be able to respond to such orders. And we took a data location agnostic approach. That means regardless of where that service provider chooses to store the data, in principle, they are obliged to deliver it with an important caveat that is, if our order should conflict with the laws of a third country that prohibits the disclosure of such data, like Ken just described for the Electronic Communications Privacy Act when it comes to content data, um, then uh, the service provider can object to divulging that information. That ensures that we respect the third country law. And we also, of course, had to take steps to improve the protection that the user itself benefits from. So we added further recourse for the user, um, uh, including a mandatory notification mechanism and the possibility to seek redress. So that ensured our, our proposals. We think um, that a lot of discussion is yet to be had and I really look forward to having some of it here with you today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Katrine, for, for all your hard work and your team's work on this. We're next fortunate to have Florence Reynal from the CNIL in France. And the CNIL has a lead role on uh, in the European Data Protection Board, I think, on these issues. Florence, we're delighted to have you here. Um, could you please tell us? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Theodore and Peter for organizing this panel and for inviting the CNIL. Uh, I apologize from the beginning and might take a little bit more time because maybe the people in the room I did not attend the other panel and so um, I will give a, a full uh, overview of, uh, of the EDPB opinion on the e-evidence proposal uh, as you asked me to do. But I will uh, start with a, um, I would say a more um, a general remark with respect to any kind of uh, cross-border uh, cross access to, to evidence. Um, and start by saying that, um, uh, of course, as the uh, jurisdiction authorities, we understand that law enforcement authorities need an efficient way to access data in a constrained time frame, of course. And we understand as well that this is a global challenge that is not limited to one territory, and that solution must be found to adjust the current instrument to the new parameters. However, having said that, access to personal data <laughs> without uh, informing the local competent authorities by foreign authorities in another jurisdiction directly to service providers without informing the data subject constitute, as you imagine, an important interference in terms of privacy rights and we think should be framed with street strict safeguards accordingly. I really support what Sophie Inveld said in, a, in a, one of the previous panel about the balance and the proportionality. The, mo the more the interference is important, 
the more you need safeguard, strict safeguard to frame that. And I think that's a kind of a motto that in fact applies to any kind of uh, initiatives. Regarding the EU evidence proposal, the EDPB adopted its opinion last September. We raised a number of concerns that we don't think that the Council uh, agreed uh, text uh, solve. Uh, I will, of course, list uh, just some of them, and my colleague Etienne Mori at the last panel also raised some of them. Uh, so it will be a, a, a just a, a choice made on the, on the different concerns. The first one is, is it really necessary? We are not convinced that traditional MLAT and uh, European investigation, uh, investigation order are so obsolete and should be bypassed. Forest communication did not explain in its uh, impact assessment and did not demonstrate why traditional cooperation instrument cannot be improved to deliver faster access. For example, we can imagine coupling requests with freezing orders to avoid disappearance of data. That's one, it's true, one uh, added value of the e-evidence proposal. One also of the work stream of the discussion for the drafting of the additional protocol to the Budapest Convention is to further elaborate on emergence, emergency mutual assistance. This, we think, should be really further explored. Uh, the second point is about burden on companies, which we think is too heavy. And there is, a, we know that there is a, really a trend, a trend to uh, shift more and more the burden to private companies of function that, in fact, are, were previously under the responsibility of public body. It was their mission, it was also their expertise. Um, and I think it's also rational with the Cloud Act. In MLAT, uh, the assessment of the lawfulness of the request and of the conflict of laws is done by public authorities. But it's now to the companies to, to make that decision. And it puts the companies, especially SMEs, in a very uncomfortable situation where they do not have necessarily the experience, the expertise, nor the resources to handle this kind of uh, complicated request. And we have doubt that the text including the Cloud Act, provide enough instrument to help companies to keep the balance right between law enforcement access and right to privacy. We have also uh, another uh, concern with respect to the rights of the data subject. We have several concerns. Let me highlight one of them, the right to be informed. Of course, this right can be limited in some circumstances, circumstances but when possible, the text should provide for an efficient delivery of that information. And it's even more important because we are talking about access by foreign governments, foreign authorities. So we think that it's also crucial because it's a key element to exercise the other rights. It's a kind of precondition, especially the right to redress. Um, and we have, in fact, really doubts, and it's a problem of, in fact, of interaction with the GDPR, that uh, the text, the, the current e-evidence proposal, solve this issue of information. Let me explain very briefly, because, in fact, under the GDPR, processors are not obliged to inform the controllers about requests of access they, they receive. And as there is quite nothing in the e-evidence proposal about that, we, we fear that, in fact, the controller that do not get the information, and so they will not be able to inform correctly the data subject. So we think that should be uh, covered. Also, we have uh, another issue that is respect to um, the abandon of the dual community in community principles, and it has been raised previously. In fact, uh, this means that uh, an issuing authority could issue for what is a crime within its, its state, but what is not necessarily a crime in another state. So it will allow an issuing authority to request data in a foreign jurisdiction, even if the country does not recognize this offense as a criminal offense. Also, we have concern about the way data are handled. It's not clear, in fact, what happened to data after its transmission to the issuing authority. We don't know exactly what the issuing authority is doing with that. Also, we think that it should be quite clear in the text that the data should be deleted when there is no production order after the preservation order. It should not, the freezing should not extend the duration of the processing. Um, 
And we have a last point, uh, that it's about conflict of flows. This text does not solve conflict also of flows. It gives some possibility to have some mechanism, but it does not solve conflict of flows. It's the same with the Cloud Act. So it makes the environment more complex. It blurs the responsibility for the actor. And we really urge uh, to uh, check the interplay between the future additional protocol of the Budapest Convention and e-evidence and Cloud Act to make that all consistent and that we find some solution that are manageable for, uh, for especially for companies. Last but not least, we think, and it has been raised as well by other panelists, that there is some potential confusion in the term that is used in e-evidence with all the text and especially the GDPR. The e-evidence proposal refers to establishment, refers to legal representative, refers to different categories of data, and uh, it creates confusion uh, as they are the same uh, terms used in the GDPR, but with not the same consequence, the same role, and the same responsibilities, for example, for the legal representative of the establishment. So we think that it will create some confusion. Let me um, now conclude. <laughs> Uh, we have made this recommendation uh, to the legislature. We hope that they will be taken on board. Uh, you can, of course, find them all in our paper. But we, just to raise that it's absolute, absolutely a strategic issue. This new way to legitimize un unilaterally access to data in a foreign jurisdiction without implication of the local authorities and without necessary information of the data subject raise many concerns and should be very carefully framed. We need also to keep in mind that we are in a situation of crisis of confidence from the individuals, from, the, from our citizens that do not feel under control of their data, either with the global actors but also with authorities. And so they think, they have the impression that things are done that they are not aware of. And we have to really to pay attention to, them, to that. That's why, as it was raised in, an, in another panel, transparency is absolutely crucial and key. Transparency in negotiation, we have to get a clear understanding of the negotiation in the EU, also in the negotiation of the Budapest protocol, additional protocol, which we find right now is quite opaque, and also in the access request that will be, will be issued by the different authorities, and we need to find solution to get the right balance between access, of course, we understand that it's important and it's necessary, but also with the right to privacy and the information of the people, so to give them the possibility to control what's going on. So, I think it was said at the, the, the previous panel, it's, I think it's a great idea to say we should use that as an opportunity. We should not see that as a kind of obstacle and barrier, but as an opportunity to develop mutual trust and mutual agreement, and again, to find this right balance between rights and also enforcement powers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Florence, very much. Um, we're next going to turn to Rita Balog from Google, who's here in their Brussels office and a council who's expert in this. Rita, maybe you could explain briefly to people who haven't lived in your position what it looks like to the service provider. And one, one comment that Florence just made is that companies may be uncomfortable to be making the decision about whether to turn it over or not. How would you think about that kind of concern? Yeah, thank you very much. So my name is Rita Balog. I'm, as Peter pointed out, I work in the public policy team here in Brussels, and I follow data-related issues, and law enforcement access is one of them. I, I'm just kind of comparing my notes with what uh, Florence and, and, and the other panelists were saying, and, and there may be some overlap uh, with what they said, not just with the previous panel, so bear with me. But maybe interesting to follow Catherine's example and start with statistics from, from our end. Um, so as you know, we're global companies. It's not a surprise that we receive access requests from pretty much every single um, country around the world. Um, as Florence pointed out, transparency is very important, and we were um, one, one of the first companies, if not the first one, to put out a transparency report. So if you want to learn a little bit more about detailed numbers, which, how, many, how many requests we get from which countries and how we're dealing with that and what are the policies behind, I would encourage you to go to our website, which is transparency.google.com. Um, so the numbers we've seen are increasing. The first report we published was in 2009, and that time the overall number was about 12,000. 
Um, this year, we have over 100,000 requests that comes in, and 10,000 is only from France. Um, so there is clearly, um, you know, more interest. And I just um, want to follow the example of Florence of taking a step back and take a note of this is a reflection of a legitimate need um, to access um, data for law enforcement purposes. I think the real question is uh, what we're trying to solve is the process of getting access to that data, a process that is uh, built on strong safeguards. Uh, rule of law protection, privacy safeguards um, that minimizes or preferably excludes the conflict of laws for companies because it's interesting to see how Peter points out that the Electronic Communication Privacy Act is a blocking statute and it's a criminal offense to disclose data, especially content data, uh, to non-US authorities at the same time. You know, um, we do see proposals. Um, that kind of unilaterally pushes companies to disclose the same data. So we clearly, as Peter pointed out, a little bit in a, between the rock and a, and a hard place. So what we've been um, advocating for is an internet, preferably and in the long term, an international framework that kind of achieve this understanding of what is the process to get access to data, what are the safeguards to, the, to get access to data, um, and uh, how do we res respect the sovereign interest and the committee of the countries involved? Uh, how do we make sure that users are notified? We are among the first companies who pushed very strongly to, for the ability to notify the user. It is our, our policy to notify the user, and this is something we have been advocating for also in the European Union. Um, how, what is the role of the um, different authorities in terms of how can we notify them? How can we notify the authority of the user implicated? This is one, and maybe Peter or Ken can say more about that, but one of the innovation of the Cloud Act is it does open up the possibility more forcefully for companies to notify the authorities of the user implicated. So indeed, this is very, very, very important. But, but um, the steps that we believed are necessary, and that was one of the questions that uh, Peter put to us, is, is MLAD good enough? What Florence was saying, is the current system good enough? We, we believe that MLAD in general is important. Uh, it's important also because we're not just receiving requests from the EU and countries um, where we can agree that there's strong rule of law protection. We receive the same requests from countries around the world, and the approach to safeguards and privacy and rule of law is considerably different from one country to another. So having um, no MLAT in place is not something that is a good outcome. Having you know, solutions, for example, in Europe, um, that would be followed and it results in other countries also going for unilateral um, solution is not an outcome that we would support. So AMLET does play a very important role. Is AMLET good? <laughs> it clearly there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, and um, maybe Ken can say more about that, but there are more and more resources from the US side invested in AMLET, which is a very good trend. Um, is, it, is it enough though, or do we need a legislative answer? From our perspective, uh, we do need a change in the legislation. We do need adoption in the legislation. This is why we supported um, legislative movement in the US, including the Cloud Act. It does open uh, the possibility to have agreements with other countries. It does have safeguards outlined uh, that are required for those agreements, which we, th we believe is a good step in the right direction. We have been part of of the consultation that the European Commission and Catherine um, and others have been uh, conducted well before the uh, release of the proposal to try to understand the concerns, uh, try to find practical answers to the concerns, um, participating more and more in trainings, etc., uh, together with, with um, people from the American administration explaining better our system, how it works. Uh, constantly improving the form to make it more straightforward um, because um, we still require for each and every request to be submitted in writing by the uh, 
the official indicating the legal grounds, et cetera, et cetera. We do evaluate every single request manually. We do check it not just against the American law, but against the law that is from the issuing member state, which does require a lot of uh, resources as France um, indicated, but it's something that we believe it's very important. So, and, and we did support, you know, a legislative action at the European Union level that has the promise of having a more harmonized approach um, on how the EU and its member states are dealing with requests that are coming directly to companies. We uh, would second the, the concerns around, are there enough safeguards um, in the proposal? Can we strengthen it? What are the ways we, we, we can strengthen it? And we have also been, uh, some of you may have heard me saying on this very same chair, probably very same panel a year ago, we have been supporting of an EU-US agreement in this field because if uh, we are about to create a more internationalized understanding of what should be the rules of accessing data for law enforcement purposes, having the EU and the US agreeing on this is an extremely important start and something that we're remaining supportive of. Probably I'm overstepping myself. Thank you, Rita, very much. Um, we'll next turn to Theodore Christakis, who's a distinguished professor of human rights and international law at the University of Grenoble in France. And we're also delighted uh, Theodore, as well as Professor Jennifer Daskal, who's been here at SCPDP, are senior fellows with our organization, the Cross-Border Data Forum, crossborderdataforum.org, which has been writing in a lot of detail on these issues, including Theodore's uh, very careful uh, evaluation of the Council's approach to e-evidence. So Theodore, uh, some opening remarks, please. Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Peter. And precisely, I would like to, to speak a little bit about uh, this Council's approach in relation with uh, what uh, has uh, just been said. Uh, and I'm also wondering, uh, and I will end my intervention with a question to Ken, how, to what extent the U.S. is following all these evidence developments, including some developments, the deletion of Article 15, for example, in, uh, from the initial uh, Commission's proposal. Uh, I will end with this question, but before this, I would just like to say that uh, um, um, the idea of uh, continuing to using mutual legal assistance mechanism is, of course, a, a, a very important idea that we need to explore. Still, uh, there are some problems, uh, a lot of problems, not just the issues of delays, uh, the EIO, the European Investigation Order, takes um, uh, uh, almost 120 days. We are hearing that uh, mutual legal assistance treaties require sometimes 10 months to get an answer. Uh, and uh, uh, this is problematic, especially, as Catherine said, in 94% of cases, uh, we have a situation where the suspect uh, is a resident of the same country uh, which issues uh, the request for the data. For example, a criminal who killed uh, uh, a girl in France who is a French suspect and the only way to establish that this person uh, was the one who killed the girl was to access his uh, Gmail account, for example. Uh, and I don't really see what is the point in all these cases of sending uh, a uh, uh, mutual legal assistant request to Ireland and have to wait for months in order to have access uh, to the Gmail or Facebook account or whatever just because the service provider is established there? Uh, the problem is that precisely because this is problematic, we have a practice which developed, uh, which is the practice of voluntary cooperation, uh, and uh, we have uh, a hugely more important number of uh, voluntary cooperation requests, which is in a gray zone. Uh, without, without any legal framework. So something needs to be done in order to introduce legal clarity and safeguards. Precisely our work with the CBDF is trying to advance some ideas because are these, are, as you said, again, are extremely complex issues and we need some uh, accuracy and also some ideas in order to advance. And uh, 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 when I see the reactions of some governments, the Netherlands, the same day that the Council adopted its approach in December, stated that this Council's draft of e-evidence opened the way for abuse by EU countries that lack sufficient guarantees over the rule of law and fundamental rights. So there is a need uh, to try to advance and to, to find uh, solutions in order to strike, as uh, you said, uh, Florence, the right balance between the need of law enforcement authorities to protect societies to access data and the need to safeguard human rights but also sovereign rights uh, and uh, the rights of all stakeholders. Uh, this is why one of the ideas that, uh, uh, that 
that uh, we tried to explore in the cross-border uh, data forum was the idea of notification not only to the user, which is an extremely important issue, uh, but also to the country of residence. As you said, this will concern uh, a very a uh, tiny uh, uh, percentage of cases, just 6%, if we take the, the um, uh, case study, uh, a hypothetical case study of the Polish authorities who want to access the data of a German resident and citizen who are stored in Ireland, uh, uh, it's a little bit bizarre, the solution, I think, uh, that the Council gave to this, because the, the Council acted the idea of a notification, but notification to the country where the service provider is established, which means that in our example, if the Polish authorities want to have access the data of a German citizen, a resident, uh, they will, uh, Germany will learn nothing, and they will send the notification to Ireland, uh, which uh, uh, is a little bit bizarre, and Ireland will not have enough incentives uh, eventually to protect the rights of German citizens or the sovereign, uh, uh, the immunities and privileges of the German state. Uh, and not only that, but we should also think about the liability of Ireland. They will not have incentives, probably the whole, only incentive will be liability. Of course, the Council's approach tried to take out all kinds of possibilities of objections or just to say that Ireland will only be able to react if a violation of Irish law takes place, but we have clear case law here by the European Court of Justice, uh, which uh, says that uh, in such a case, Ireland uh, will have an obligation to protect Article 51. As they will apply EU law, they will have an obligation uh, to protect the Charter of Fundamental Rights, irrespective of the place where the target, even if he is in Germany. So I wonder how uh, uh, countries with a lot of uh, service providers will accept uh, such a, a solution. Just to end precisely, we introduced some ideas in the papers, but I would like to end with my question. Uh, 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 um, and the conclusion, I was wondering, uh, uh, we discussed conflict of laws, there was a, a, a very protective mechanism in your commission's proposal. For example, if there uh, could be, uh, if we request Google data which are stored uh, in the US concern, uh, a US resident or citizen, there was a possibility not only to inform uh, the, um, the United States, but also for the United States to object so that there will be no violation of the Stored Communications Act. This was deleted. And I think that this was very much linked to the future negotiations. I was wondering, uh, Ken, uh, uh, how you follow these developments concerning the evidence, because you have a lot of questions and you need to, to, to bring a lot of response about the Cloud Act. But I, I was wondering, what is the position of the US about what the evidence developments, especially this, uh, uh, the fact that the Council downgraded all this uh, conflict of laws protection? and as it also, a second question, as it is the first time that we have in the same panel uh, um, a representative from the Department of Justice and from the European Commission, you will start negotiating probably very, very soon. <laughs> I, I, as an academic, I know that you will not answer, but uh, how do you see these negotiations? Uh, how are you going to deal with the reciprocity issues? I was just wondering if you can give so, us some... So I'm going to ask for Ken not to take up the last half hour of the panel by answering the seven questions Theodore just posed. Uh, <laughs> okay, do, do you have... Uh, I was going to say, I'd, I'd rather talk about mutual legal assistance. I could talk about that until 5 o'clock or the cocktail hour. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you a little bit on this answer in that... Um, I can, what I can say is that we very carefully follow uh, all developments uh, in uh, European law that can have an effect on uh, our operations. Uh, we have a very close uh, relationship. I have a very close one right here on the sofa, but we also have a close institutional relationship with the European Union in which we discuss uh, issues of mutual interest. And um, uh, we... Um, other than that, what I, what I can only say is that uh, we don't uh, engage in intergovernmental discussions in public fora such as these. <laughs> so I kind of have to leave it there. And, and in terms of the, the issue, uh, as far as e-evidence is concerned, and as far as the issue of, uh, of the agreement, uh, potential agreement is concerned, we're waiting to see what happens with the, uh, with the mandate. And uh, there will be discussions, no doubt. Uh, we want to help our European partners, as I've said before, to be able to get the evidence that they need for their, uh, for their authorities that's uh, held by U.S. Pro providers. Uh, 
Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it develops. That's about all I can say about that. Um, so I'm going to turn to, uh, we're going to return to this, our MLATs enough question for the following reason. Um, we, we, it's come up from several people on the panel. And uh, on Wednesday, Sophie Intfeldt, in a very, uh, I think, a striking way, explained her reasons for thinking MLATs are a good default to have. MLATs have a very high level of protections before data is transferred about a data subject. Um, and, and so I might turn to Katrine on this. The commission has favored an e-evidence proposal, but we've heard from the data protection officials, Florence, we've heard from the parliament, Sophie Infelt, uh, an idea that maybe this whole thing's not necessary. So how would you, how would you respond to that? Go, yeah, you, and we'll have Ken go after Katrine. All right, thank you very much. Um, actually, I think uh, Theodore already started to address it in his comments, and I just want to pick that up again. We're, we've turned into the statistics task force here. <laughs> just to tell you that uh, the figures he cited in terms of the time it takes are also the figures that we found. So you have an average of about 10 months before you can expect a response from the U.S. on a mutual legal assistance request, and we have a deadline of a total of 120 days when you look at the European investigation order within Europe, which I know does not include Ireland, which is the location of many important providers, and does not have that market-based principle. So instead of creating a level playing field for all providers that offer services in Europe, uh, it only captures those that have their main establishment in Europe and can be serviced with orders in Europe at the location of their main establishment. That leaves out some important actors, including some uh, sitting right on this panel. So um, that's why we thought that this in and of itself does not suffice. Um, another consideration that we had, of course, is related to the volatility of the data. So if you look at those deadlines and then you um, compare it to the average duration of storage of the data, if you look at metadata, uh, oftentimes it is stored uh, for a total of five to seven days if you look at statistics from traditional telcos because they actually do not need it, plus there is no legislation requiring them to keep it. So according to the data minimization principle, which I'm sure I don't need to explain to any of you here, um, they actually have to delete it. And there is no way that using the traditional tools we could get to that data in five to seven days. However, um, Florence rightly raised that there may be a crisis of confidence uh, of users in Europe and I would uh, posit that that crisis of confidence relates not only to uh, access by authorities but also to the fact that we have multiplying data breaches, that we have sharing, un almost unfettered sharing of child sexual abuse images, that we have many crimes that pertain to the essential privacy of the users that at the moment uh, are conducted in complete impunity. We have statistics from the Council of Europe, statistics again, that show that only about 1% of those cybercrime cases that are reported will result in a judgment. And uh, I mean, any of you know that uh, it takes a long time for people even to consider uh, going to the authorities when it comes to cybercrimes because of course in many of the cases you know that the answer from your local authority will be, sorry, we can't do anything about that. So there's a, there's a crisis of confidence also when it comes to um, actually going after malicious actors that uh, have an impact on all of our privacy. And for those um, actors, the mutual legal assistance mechanisms don't match the need. And again, um, I think for electronic evidence, we're in a special situation because uh, the traditional mechanism addresses the country where the order will be served which is the country of the service provider, but not the country of the target. So that country is usually not well placed to actually have any say on how that user's privacy can best be protected. Ken. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, you may not know it, but I've been a mutual legal assistance practitioner for most of my career. You're a lucky man. <laughs> I, I consider myself to be. Uh, and uh, you have to remember how we got to where we are today which is that as the 2000s started, there was a very substantial increase in the number of requests for electronic evidence to the US. I'm, I'm only speaking from my US experience. And uh, even though I believe that uh, the US central authority is the largest central authority in the world, it, it just couldn't keep up. And uh, it's really, it's a question of resources among other things. And uh, the, 
the difficulties that arose came from even the largest central authority in the world not being able to necessarily keep up with the ever-increasing amount of requests for uh, electronic evidence because so much evidence is electronic nowadays, but also there was the, uh, the Budapest Convention came along and so there were tools for seeking cooperation and more and more countries were using those tools. So everything snowballed to the point where it was taking so long that uh, countries were justifiably concerned. And it became clear that there was a need for some supplemental mechanism to, uh, to aid uh, mutual legal assistance. Now, for us, we were able to get a significant amount of additional resources, and we, we restructured ourselves so that we could create economies of scale in answering our partners' requests. And we've brought down the amount of time it takes to uh, execute a request quite substantially. But the projections are that the amount of requests are going to continue to spiral upward and that uh, as a result, MLA is not, it's not realistic that it's going to be able to be the only result. And whatever uh, uh, issues we had with augmenting our resources, there are many other central authorities around the world who have even more issues in being able to get the funding from their own governments to rapidly increase their manpower. So, and just to end on this, because I said I could talk to the cocktail hour, mutual legal assistance is not going away by any means. There are going to be areas uh, outside of the scope of a cloud agreement, for example, or um, with certain countries that are not going to have that kind of an agreement. Mutual legal assistance has to get better because it's always going to be there and it's, and it's vital that it be as uh, efficient as possible. Um, okay, so for, for a CPDP audience, we've just, I'll come to you in just a second, Florence. In a CPDP audience, this threshold question of whether reform is worth doing seems to me a key item. And Florence, I think you have a follow-up thought here. Yeah, just, just to clarify one thing, because you said that we consider that as that MLAT as suffi are sufficient. That, that's not uh, what we think. Uh, as they are today, they for sure should be improved. What we... Um, what what is for, for us um, the room for uh, for improvements is also for the Commission to investigate and to uh, demonstrate uh, how uh, it can be improved. So to do really a study, a deep analysis on the the way it uh, uh, functions today, and the statistics that you raise and the points you raise are very in important and interesting, and to see how we can uh, use the I mean the the the, the instrument that are uh, are used today and how we can improve them. You talk about resources. I think it was also one of the points raised by the Commission in its report, resources. Uh, but maybe there are other, other uh, aspects that, uh, can, that can be done. And um, we don't, I mean, we think that it's maybe too easy to say, well, it doesn't work, so let's, uh, let's go directly to the, to the providers and, and find another text and, and add another layer. Uh, so that's, that's about the, you know, the message is that, Let's first see how we can improve things, um, and maybe as, uh, with all the experience that we have, there are interesting options on the table to make that uh, more, uh, more efficient, um, but do not, do not go directly to another solution uh, uh, and, and try to, uh, to escape from, from, from this one. And, and just one thing, uh, sorry to say on the Budapest Convention, because it has been mentioned several times, um, Budapest Convention is true, it's, it's working today, it's a legal basis today, it's an international convention that is uh, used today. However, we don't necessarily have the same interpretation, especially on Article 32 and the consent, who should give its consent to the, to the request. Uh, some uh, uh, some government consider that it's uh, the, 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 the company, so we go back to this idea of it's that it's the provider that provides the information and that decide to provide the information. We think, and it was an old uh, opinion of the Working Party 29, that it should be also, uh, in when, when possible, the consent of the, of the person. So we don't necessarily have, uh, again, the same interpretation on the Budapest Convention. We're going to go to Rita, and then I'm going to switch topics to another important topic. Just because... Um Florence reminded me I did not actually address your question about the role of the provider and what should be the role of the provider. I think um, it's not as black and white and sometimes it is position. I think it's very important to have the ability to notify the authorities. 
um, so they know. It's, and, and it's also very, very important for the provider to be able to say, to go back to the authorities and challenge um, a request that we're getting, which we do, which we did push back on requests which were, for example, overly broad, and it's important to have that ability, and we, and we would really not like to see that ability go away. Um, having said that, when we challenge a request, we challenge it in front of a court. So it's not like the, the, the company would become the ultimate decision maker or completely taken out of the authority's hand. Um, and I think it's the danger that I see with some of these conversations is, of course, there are companies, there are few companies who have the resources um, to dedicate the same way that we or other maybe bigger providers do. And, and, and we're absolutely ready to acknowledge that. Having said that, you know, the, the danger of the debate that I see right now is to say, okay, the, the service provider should play no role. If I get a request, I just disclose. And if I don't do that, I get a two person annual worldwide turnover fine, which at another forum, Theodore joked with me, but that's already a discount. Um, we, if, if we can, it's important that we should, we, we should be able to review the request. We should be able to push back and we should be able to go to the court if these requests are too broad or otherwise um, not in line with the legal requirements. So along with the, the role of MLATs, uh, whether they're enough or just improve MLATs or go a different route, the other big debate I've heard at CPDP is how GDPR fits with the Cloud Act and these changes. And so I'll explain two possible maximum positions and then I'm curious for the panelists to tell us what they think. So one maximum position is that Article 48 of GDPR essentially blocks these new data sharing approaches because it's so broad um, in its language. Another view would be that there are enough derogations or other provisions that the data can flow freely without any effect from GDPR. And this will be very important as data goes to the United States because the difference between blocking all data flows and blocking zero data flows is at the center of, I think, a lot of people's concerns about these issues. So um, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure who first to, to go to. Maybe, maybe uh, Katrine, what, what's the commission's view of, uh, of how these, uh, these rules interact? Sure, great. Um, and just as a cliffhanger, let me quickly in one minute say that we are, of course, committed to improving mutual legal assistance. We have not abandoned it by any means. In fact, we're investing millions to improve the systems. I just don't want to go into all the measures that we take. We just determined that for the specific category of those three types of data that constitute electronic evidence under our proposals, that system does not fit. That does not in any way discount our commitment to mutual legal assistance, uh, for, for example, for the situations where there are conflicts of laws or where for other reasons mutual legal assistance is better placed. And in fact, with Ken, we are working on improving that. Um, now, on that wonderful question about how the GPR fits with international agreements, in fact, I would note that Article 48 explicitly provides for international agreements for data transfers um, and that we also have an umbrella agreement in place uh, and a privacy shield where we can um, basically look at how those rules can um, support the kinds of data flows that might be envisaged under any EU-US agreement. And I cannot go into any details, but just to say that um, we are sufficiently confident to um, have asked the College of Commissioners to consider a mandate for negotiations for possible adoption in the forthcoming future. And, and to the extent there are existing international agreements, there's language in Article 48 that would suggest the data can flow. Uh, um, Florence, uh, we talked before the panel, I, I know that the EDP, EDPB has been looking at this, so could you tell us your views? Um, yeah, yeah it, it should be confirmed in two weeks time when we will issue our uh, a public um, a public program for 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 the next two years, uh, and uh, but that's one of the subjects that is on the table. It's though the interpretation that we want to give to this uh, Article 48, and so the interaction uh, also uh, the interplay with Article 49. But um, let's let's go back to 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 the philosophy of the text. I mean the the idea of Article 48 
uh, as as uh, as you rightly said, is uh, is that um, uh, or any request from a foreign authorities can be an administrative or judicial authorities uh, should be done in the in the in the framework of uh, of, of MLAT. So the idea is to that, that's I mean that's the main message is that it should be framed and should be and MLAT should be used in that regard. After the derogation that can be used is uh, just derogations that should not become the the mainstream to uh, to to send data abroad uh, to use. Uh, um, the uh, public interest, uh, uh, or, or to use a legitimate interest, or whatever. I mean, that's not uh, the idea or, uh, of the legislature under uh, Article 48. So uh, we, we have uh, to uh, to um, maybe uh, clarify the interplay between Article 48 and 49. But as we always said for. Uh, I think uh, 15 years, uh, derogation and exemption are should be interpreted in a very strict way, and for the public interest, there is in, in, indeed this uh, the fact that it should be linked to the public interest of the union. Uh, but anyway, that's it's it's uh, it's a good question, <laughs> and uh, uh, hopefully we we will have a paper uh, on that one. This is certainly a question that people who work in this area are are, are fighting about and arguing about. Ken, uh, your view on this? I, I just want to uh, point out a couple of anomalies I've observed about uh, the text of Article 48. Uh, one of them uh, being, what is the meaning of the term without prejudice to the other bases for transfer under this chapter? Uh, if uh, uh, Article 48 uh, is, uh, has a strong breaking effect, and the second one, uh, just to mention it quickly, is, um, and it's, it is an anomaly, is that the reference to mutual legal assistance treaties. Because mutual legal assistance treaties are used for preventing, detecting, combating, uh, uh, investigating, and prosecuting criminal offenses. And so by, their, by its terms, that is um, covered under the uh, police directive and not under the GDPR. So the fact that MLATs are mentioned in Article 48 is, I think, an anomaly uh, that throws into question w exactly what it means. Uh, Rita or, or Theodore? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we uh, read with interest the Commission's amicus contribution to the Microsoft case. We read with interest the previous comments from Article 29 and looking forward to the board opinion on this. <laughs> Theodore? <laughs> Very quickly, because uh, we might have questions also from the room, uh, I just read with a lot of interest the guidelines on Article 49, which gave the impression that we need, not necessarily for me a uh, mutual legal assistance treaty, but we, the, the treaty, uh, a framework agreement between the EU and the US, uh, will certainly be enough in order to resolve the problem. But while waiting for this, uh, I don't have the impression that these guidelines uh, confirm the idea that there is no problem with the GDPR, on the contrary. Um, we, I, we did start about 10 minutes late because of the passage of time, so we'll only have a short time for questions. Katitsa. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I would like to correct a uh, misconception also about at least what I said, not others. Um, the reason uh, why I care about the extraterritorial warrants is not because it's a new power that is expansive. It's because the reach and the scope of how the wording of the provision is, is expansive. Because when the Cybercrime Convention was written in 2001, there were no, a huge amount of data holding um, the world's data of all the citizens around the world in the United States. And this scope had changed. So that's why we think that, that's why many organizations from civil society, Latin America, Europe, um, Af uh, around the world, join and file an amicus brief with the U.S. Supreme Court in the Microsoft Ireland case, arguing that warrants issued by U.S. courts cannot compel the disclosure of communications content stored outside the United States. And that's the reason why we care about that provision. Being said that, here is my question. Will, be, will the Justice Department continue to use warrants rather than subpoenas to obtain the content information of not just persons stored abroad, abroad by American-based service providers? Let me be more precise here. The extraterritorial provision applies to U.S. providers, including, including those foreign companies who have a sufficient jurisdictional nexus to the United States. So my first question will be, 
We have about three minutes left in the panel. With a, company, uh, with a company like Telegram, even though in Germany, is subject to the U.S. territorial order because it serves customers in the United States. And in those scenarios, if a foreign company who has a sufficient jurisdictional nexus with the United States, will the U Justice Department continue to use <laughs> warrants rather than subpoenas to obtain the content of information on non-Jewish persons stored abroad? Thank you. Let, and let's take the second question or comment, and then we'll have final remarks from each person briefly. Uh, thank you, panel, for an excellent discussion. I have a question which has two parts. First is uh, specifically addressed to Google. So if companies like uh, Google identify themselves as global company, uh, why do all the uh, legitimate requests from federal governments need to satisfy law where the company is headquartered, or where the company is established, or where the data is stored? I mean, shouldn't all government requests be treated equally by the global company, and would Google endorse that idea? Uh, second is, uh, to counter the challenges of slow processes like MLAs, uh, countries like India are resorting to uh, practices like uh, <clears throat> data localization, forcing service providers to have an establishment and store data locally. Um, it might not be totally effective, but uh, it's surely better than the current processes to give uh, government access to data. So how do you convince governments that are resorting to practices like data localization not to take this shortcut given the challenges which the data sharing offers? Thank you. So we're going to have a short time on India. Uh, my research group with an Indian group published a report this month on possible ways forward for India and data sharing. We, we have so many different things in those questions, but I, if each of you would like to say just a brief remark for whatever the last thing you'd like to say. We'll go down the row. Uh, well, uh, I don't know anything about how Telegram operates, so I can't really answer that question. Uh, the other question as to what uh, kind of uh, process or what kind of compulsory order the U.S. would use. I, th I think it's not extraterritorial, our, our orders. They are served on U.S. companies that are established in the United States. They're domestic orders, and we apply the domestic standard, uh, whatever the data is. But that's where I'd leave it. Katrina, any final comment? Um, yes, thank you, Peter. And um, just to pick up on this notion of extraterritoriality, um, I think it just shows that in these situations, we have so many different competing connecting factors. The location of the data, the location of the target, the location of the service provider, and everybody has a different opinion of what it means to be extraterritorial. But I assure you that regardless of which you pick, since they will never be all three in the same place, any law will have extraterritorial uh, extraterritorial reach depending on which connecting factor you choose to look at. So that's an unsolvable problem. Uh, we just have to choose to live with it by picking the connecting factor that we think is most appropriate. Yes, we're going to continue for just a few sentences from each of the last three panelists. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was a very, a very interesting discussion. Um, but just to say that we have maybe also to look at the international dimension also of the problem. We are talking a lot about EU-US, which is of course absolutely key considering the actors uh, that are, uh, the main actors are in the US, but also see that from a broader perspective and also to see the, in, in certain way the implication of what we are discussing now with access by foreign authorities also to our data, but not necessarily in the EU, but can be, in, for example, in the US. So, for example, if the US concludes executive agreement with foreign authorities, what would be the impact if those foreign authorities access to our data that will be stored in the US company? So, we have just to look also at the broader dimension. I just want one thing also to complement what I say about the Budapest Convention and the interpretation that we had about the consent. It was the consent of the people, but also the consent of the authorities, the competent authorities. And I wanted to add that because it's linked also to the, the rationale of the, of the mutual legal assistance. Thank you. So I have to admit I'm sitting in Brussels and I can't give you the specific scent of, of India, so I apologize. The general answer to that and the way we evaluate the request is we are um, headquartered in the United States. We need to look at what the United States laws are. Uh, beyond that, we're also looking at um, the Global Network Initiative and the human rights standards in there. And we do look at the national laws. So when we do get a response 
sorry, I need, to, I need to bring a European example, which I know better than India, but for example, France, we do look at the French laws um, and, and evaluate the, or evaluate, we look at the, the request in light of the national law. So um, I think we've, we've, we've covered some of the highlights of this topic. There's much more that's being written and being discussed by, by all of these actors. And let's thank our panel for their participation. Today.